In this lesson, we're going to go over the order of components that's going to need to happen in your typical irrigation system. I talk in generalities in this you know, introduction course, so there's maybe some some exceptions out there and deal with those individually, but for just a typical residential or light commercial system, there's going to be a, an order of components that needs to happen. The first thing that you're going to have is your source, whether that's a meter or a curb stop, it may be a well pump or a lake pump, or maybe you're tapping into an existing plumbing system of the building, the house, or commercial building, or whatever, it's your source, right? That's the very first thing, but the, the, the next component, which is really the first component of an irrigation system, as defined by code, and really it's the American Water Works Association that says that once the water has entered into your irrigation pipes, it cannot be sucked or pushed back into the main drinking water supply. That's a no-no. So what we're going to use here is a backflow preventer. And a backflow preventer is a device that does that. It stops water from being sucked backwards or pushed backwards back into the supply point. So that's going to be a double check valve assembly, a pressure vacuum breaker, a reduced pressure principle assembly. Um, these all have isolation valves on the device itself for testing, but you may be in a situation to where it's a residential system and what's allowed in your area is anti-siphon valves. And what an ASV, an anti-siphon valve is, is a, a zone valve that has a, a vacuum breaker in it, which is a backflow prevention unit and a zone valve in one piece. And a, a lot of you know, municipalities or states or counties or cities will allow that. So what should really be the first component in that situation is an isolation valve. Wherever your source is, the very next thing in line should be an isolation valve so that you can isolate, you can shut off that irrigation system in case there's a leak on the irrigation system or a zone is stuck on and running all the time, you can shut it down or the homeowner or the client can go out and shut it off without having to shut off the water supply to the house or to their commercial building or whatever, which could really cause a situation, a loss of revenue or whatever. Or it's just an inconvenience to a homeowner to have to shut the, the water main down to their house because there's a valve stuck on on the irrigation system. So you should always have an isolation valve as your very first thing. And so that, that really should be a backflow preventer or an isolation valve plus anti-siphon valves. So now beyond that, the next component would be a pressure reduction valve, a pressure reducing valve if necessary. And usually my uh, rule on that is if there's more than 75 or 80 PSI going into the irrigation system, I'll generally want to put a pressure reducing valve on it. And now it comes after the backflow preventer. Now logic would say that it would come before the backflow preventer if you're trying to protect all the components from high pressure, but the problem is with most of these three quarter and one inch pressure reducing valves is that they're a two-piece construction and the top screws down into the bottom. It's usually a brass body. So that's a potential cross connection in a, a backward suctioning, a suctioning situation. You could possibly pull water down through those threads and have a cross connection and contaminate your drinking water supply. So usually by code, we'll want to put that after the backflow preventer. So there's another reason just, you know, for, for having it uh, for high pressure on that. It's for one to pr protect this, the system from having too high pressure. And if you have really high pressure, that means that the water is moving really fast when the system is on, right, which is a, a high velocity. And then when the valve shuts off, that's when you get water hammer, which is that chugging or, or banging sound that you hear in the system when the valve shuts off. And that can really beat apart your system, cause cracks, breaks, or cause the glue to come loose if you didn't use glue, a good gluing procedure there. Or for polyethylene systems where you have barbed fittings and you push 
the, the polyethylene, the black flexible tubing on it, and then put a clamp on there, a lot of times those are only rated for 80 PSI. So you definitely want to control the pressure going into a polyethylene system. But also on PVC systems, your fittings, your elbows, your tees, most of those are going to be rated at 120 PSI. I think if you get up to a Schedule 80 fittings, uh, those are rated at 150 PSI, but you shouldn't be ever really having your system running at that high of a pressure. And for two, most of your sprinkler heads really want 45 or 55 to be the maximum PSI going into that head because it'll cause atomization or the water coming out the nozzle is going to turn into a fine mist because of the high pressure and then get blown away before it reaches its target. Really what you want is the pressure to be just right on that at 35 to 45 PSI so that you have large droplets that leave the sprinkler head and land on the intended area. So we have our source, backflow preventer or isolation valve, pressure reducing valve, and now a master valve if you're going to use one. I always install master valves on all the systems that I installed because it's a safety feature. It's really an upgrade, but it's really a safety feature that every system should have. And what it does is it stops pressurization of the entire irrigation system when it's not running. Right, Your typical irrigation timer should have enough voltage, enough amperage to open up two or maybe even three valves at once. So you have your zone valve, but you can also put a master valve at the very beginning of the system there in this order so that when it's time, let's say it's 6 a.m. on Monday and it's time for the irrigation system to run, it turns on valve number one, but it also turns on the master valve and opens up so the entire system can be pressurized and run. And then it's going to hold open the master valve while it goes through zone one, zone two, and so forth. And then when it gets done running its zone valves, it shuts down those valves, you know, whatever the last valve is, number six, and it also shuts down your master valve. So now your system isn't under constant pressure, and if there's a leak that's happening on the system, it's not going to continue to leak 24-7, right? So it's, it's going to capture, when the master valve shuts down, it's going to capture that 70 or 80 PSI in that main line, but if there's a little leak that happens, then it's going to drain down to that pressure to where it equalizes in the system and stop leaking, whereas if you didn't have a master valve, you're going to have that leak that's happening all the time, and what happens is on a house or a commercial building, a lot of times you'll have the, the main line will wrap around the building to supply the, the valves that's in the back or around the other side. And a lot of times people aren't walking around their house every single day or they're not walking around their commercial building every single day. And if you have a leak that happens, it could go unnoticed for days or weeks or even months and cause uh, a, a damage to the landscape, to the turf, to plants in the area, but it could also cause you to lose a lot of money in water just from that water escaping from the leak. Whereas if you had a master valve on it, then you'd never even know the leak was there. When the system is running, it's under dynamic pressure, which is less than the static pressure. Static pressure is when the water's not moving, it's just under pressure and just sitting there pushing on all of the, the valves and the T's and the elbows, and it's pushing, pushing. But when the, the system turns on, now you have it under dynamic pressure, which is usually 25 to 30% less than the static pressure. So, a lot of times when the system is running, that little tiny leak is not even going to be leaking anyway. And so uh, as a repair technician to go in and work on systems that don't have master valves, sometimes I'll put one on there if we can't find the leak or it's so small, but we know we're losing money, we know, we know we're losing water, you can go back and retrofit a master valve on and then you'll never even think about that leak again because it'll never present itself. It'll only leak while the system is running and guess what? It's just adding water to the rest of the water that you're irrigating the landscape with at the time. And so generally, if, if the leak is big enough, then you're going to see it, the water, you're going to know where it's at and find it and repair it. But if it's a small leak, it is acceptable to go in and put a master valve on a system that doesn't have one. So we have our source, backflow preventer or isolation valve, 
pressure reducing valve, master valve, and now you've got the piping that's the main line of the system and it's going to go out to your valve manifold or out to each of the valves in a valve satellite method. And then you're going to have a zone valve, right? And that's where your wires are going to run out to is your zone valves. And then the, the pipes leave your zone valve and then go out to the heads. And now if you're brand new to sprinkler systems, you know, we don't have wires that go to the sprinklers. The wires go out to the valves. The valve turns on and allows the zone pipes to fill up with water. And the pressure is what pushes the head up and starts it to water. I've talked with, you know, new people that I was training for the first time or homeowners, you know, when we dig a head up, they go, where are the wires? Well, that's not the way it works. We only have wires going to our valves. But when you get to high level systems such as sports fields or golf courses, sometimes those big heads that are, you know, maybe running 20 gallons per minute, they may even have the valves that are in the heads and have wires that go out to the actual sprinklers themselves because it's a combination sprinkler and valve. But chances are if you're taking this course, you're never going to be seeing or working on this until you get 5, 10, 15 years into your career and then you can move up and start working on these high-tech systems.